Today in British Columbia in Canada, we face some pretty significant uh, challenges, uh, largely driven by events that are out of our control around the world, uh, but events no nonetheless that are going to impact British Columbia and Canada. Uh, but as I always have believed, in every crisis or every challenge, there's also an opportunity. And there are lots of opportunities for British Columbia in the months and years ahead if we are smart and if we take advantage of them both as a province and as a country. And I want to talk today about some of those opportunities and how British Columbia is extraordinarily well positioned to capitalize on what is taking place around the world. It is incredible to me uh, just how quickly things can change. Um, we, we've all seen uh, what can happen, the, the speed of the collapse uh, in the U.S. markets, uh, particularly uh, as a result of the U.S. subprime crisis, was just remarkable how quickly things can change in the United States in late 2008, 2009. Uh, and obviously that uh, resulted in British Columbia being in a position where we were dragged down, as was everyone in the private and public sectors, into, unfortunately, back into a deficit position uh, in 2009, which mean that, meant that uh, we triggered our balanced budget legislation. And our balanced budget legislation says that in British Columbia, if government goes into a deficit, we are required by law to get back to a balanced budget within three years. And in the interim, all ministers in government take a 20% pay cut. Uh, they have to earn back that pay cut in two ways. Half of it they get back if we meet our individual ministerial budget targets within our ministries. Uh, the other half we don't get back until we actually balance the budget collectively right across government. Uh, which means that we've all taken a 10% pay cut and we'll continue to until we get back into uh, a balanced budget situation. I think that's actually uh, something that you don't often see in governments called accountability. And uh, I uh, do fondly wish though that when we drafted that legislation uh, back in early, I think it was 2002, that we included a tiny little escape clause that said if there's a global international economic event beyond your control, uh, it won't apply. But we didn't do that. Um, You'll also know that back in July uh, of last year, July 2011, when I released our public accounts, which is sort of the finalized numbers for our 10-11 fiscal year, uh, we actually ended up the year outperforming our deficit. Our deficit target was 1.7 billion. That's what we were supposed to end up at. We outperformed it by 1.4 billion dollars. We ended up with a 309 million dollar deficit. We almost balanced the budget in 1011, and uh, that was because we had locked down and and made sure that we were really riding herd on cost control uh, to ensure that we would uh, outperform, which I think is really an important message, particularly in the world that we live in today. Um, but I mentioned at the time that although that was good news, I was very concerned about two events that at that time were just starting to get some attention. The first was uh, the European sovereign debt situation and the second was what was happening in the U.S. in terms of the, the debt negotiations that were taking place. I felt that one or both of those events, if not managed properly, could result in impacts on British Columbia that we would have no control over but that had serious downside prospects. So, um, we then, of course, had the outcome of the HST referendum, which, although uh, I, I think we, we came close, uh, we, we were unsuccessful in retaining the HST, and we are following through on the commitment to return back to a PST GST, but it also had the unpleasant uh, requirement to have to repay the federal government $1.6 billion, which, uh, under accounting principles, we're required to book all of that in this fiscal year. So that meant that our deficit this year is now just uh, you're tracking it just over three billion dollars, which is not a position you want to be in as a Minister of Finance, but it's a reality and you have to deal with that. But every day since then, I have watched and we have watched collectively and it's gotten more attention, the unfolding, uh, what I described when I came back from Europe as a slow motion train wreck, the, the uh, economic um, and the turbulence in the European markets driven by what they call sovereign debt crisis or governments that have lost control of spending and are trying to figure out how to get control back. Um, it was uh, very interesting. I was there in September uh, promoting BC bonds. Um, we have uh, found with some interest that when we do what are called US dollar global issues uh, and raise money, 
to help fund services in British Columbia through our BC bonds that uh, about 25% of the buyers consistently uh, recently have been Europeans and, and that was of interest to us and it's obviously a big market of people so we were going to the markets to talk about BC bonds, make sure they, un make sure they understood the BC story, etc. so that we can diversify our opportunities to raise money and save money for taxpayers. And uh, whether I was in London, Paris, Frankfurt, Munich, Zurich, uh, it didn't matter where. What I was hearing from central bankers, from investment bankers, people that were involved in the day-to-day -day challenges that they're facing in Europe uh, was really very, very worrisome. And of course, they probably speak a little more freely to me than they might say to uh, in media. Uh, but everything I heard uh, left me with some really significant uh, concerns. But one of the things that I took away from that is we're facing a new reality. There is, folks, uh, a new paradigm for governments in the world today. And that new paradigm is that the days of markets tolerating governments that are taxing and overspending and taxing and overspending are finished. They don't have to actually fund debt. Uh, they don't have to fund prolificacy and irresponsibility if they choose not to. And you're seeing that played out in Europe and it's probably uh, going to come home more to roost in perhaps even in Canada, but certainly in U.S. states and municipalities and others that have not had good fiscal discipline are going to reap the whirlwind. And it's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be very unpleasant. So that's one thing. The second thing is those governments that are serious about being fiscally prudent and fiscally disciplined by action, not words, because it's easy to talk the talk, but it's quite another to deliver, and markets and investors are going to be looking for action, not talk. Those that are prepared to do so will be rewarded. They'll be rewarded with new investment. They will be rewarded with being able to borrow at uh, key preferential rates, very low rates, uh, and that is going to be often at the expense of others that have not been so responsible. That is the opportunity for British Columbia. It is an incredible opportunity for us to take advantage of a very uncertain world and make sure that people understand the BC Canadian story because it is a great story. It is a very, very positive story. So as Europeans, both at the sovereign level and at the banking level, are deleveraging. In other words, they are uh, at the government level or are trying to uh, get control of their fiscal houses. And that means they're you know, trying to raise taxes and pay down debt and deficits. And then at the, at the banking level, they're trying to recapitalize and they're getting out of lending. Some, sometimes they're getting out of entire sectors of lending to try and uh, boost and, and support their, their capital and liquidity. Um, that is creating a situation that unfortunately is, is probably going to, if not already, see the European zone uh, dealing in a recessionary environment. The U.S., which is sort of the traditional safe haven for investment, um, will receive some benefit. You're seeing that in the short term with Treasury uh, spreads being very depressed um, because people, when they get scared about what's happening in the world, typically fly to uh, U.S. Treasuries. Uh, but the U.S. has its own problems, and they've got their own significant uh, problems, and you saw that with the failed debt negotiations. They have been unable to provide the leadership necessary to demonstrate to financial markets that they're going to get their act together. So that is a worrisome thing, but I think uh, most people will say, well, even in spite of that, that is still the biggest, most resilient market in the world, and, and uh, uh, they will be given a little more latitude than, than perhaps others. But adding to that, we have to watch what's going on in Asia um, because, of course, China, which is often seen as the engine of growth in Asia, their largest export market is Europe. And so if Europe goes into a recession, that's going to have some impact on exports out of China. And that's something we have to watch carefully. I'm also watching uh, the, the uh, huge proportion of China's economy is fixed asset investment. And uh, I'm a little nervous uh, about the levels of investment there, but that's a whole other speech. Uh, but let's just say that we have to watch all of these things. So what What's happening in BC? Well, our economy is recovering better than uh, many others uh, from the 0809 economic meltdown. Uh, we posted a 3% real GDP growth rate in 2010. Um, last year, indicators were a little bit mixed, um, and that's really reflected by some of the private sector forecasters who uh, expect GDP growth in 2011-12 to be a more modest 2.3%. We have uh, internally in government, we've uh, fixed a more conservative number of 2%. Uh, but I hope I'm wrong on the upside there because that'll help us. Uh, and we've, um, and the private sector economists are averaging about 2.1% GDP growth forecast in 2012. I understand Helmut was speaking to you earlier, Helmut Pastrick earlier, and, and he's upgraded his predictions a little bit for BC um, 
next year, uh, which uh, I hope he's right, and I really do. Um, both employment and consumer spending are up slightly, but the main bright spot for British Columbia and what really sets us apart from every other province is the uh, export growth we're seeing. Last year, BC exports were up almost 15% um, uh, year to date to October, bucking expectations given the sluggish US economy. And I think it's really important to pause here and understand that this just didn't happen by some kind of fluke. It happened as a result of a lot of the work that we've all done together. It happened when British Columbia and the private sector and the business community and the federal government all together said, you know what, we need to diversify BC's economy and make sure at least part of our economy is going to be tied to the fastest growing part of the world, which is Asia. The British Columbia had unique uh, uh, prospects for that because we were the only Pacific province. And that's why we invested in the Pacific Gateway, the Asia Pacific Gateway. Um, that whole strategy, which has levered about $15 billion of private and public sector investment in our ports, our airports, our railroads, our highway infrastructure, is all about making sure that we take advantage of the growth prospects in the fastest growing part of the world. And ladies and gentlemen, today, one of the things that we see in British Columbia that no other province enjoys is that our exports, which back when I first got elected in 2001 were almost 80% directed to one market, the United States. Today, only half our exports go to the United States, the other half, about 30% to Asia and the rest around the world. That is diversification in action, and that's why we are better positioned, I would argue, to be able to handle uh, some of the shocks uh, that, that uh, all of us are feeling. So diversification is, is going to be very important going forward, and, and we're going to continue to ensure that BC is aggressive in uh, every key market around the world. So that partnering has worked uh, and we're going to continue to uh, hopefully see uh, some improvements there. The other thing that I think is really playing to BC's advantage, and boy did I hear this big time in Europe when I was speaking to a lot of the investment community, and that is the 10 years of fiscal discipline that we've had in place are really paying off for us now. Uh, and I want to take a moment to understand why that is. So we got elected in 2001. As you know, we inherited a structural deficit of just under $3 billion. We passed the balanced budget legislation, said we had to get it back to balance by 04. We did that. Then we ran surpluses for many years. We were able to pay down debt and lower taxes on the basis of those surpluses. And that's put us in a position today where we are really well positioned. Uh, to navigate some of the difficult seas that are going to really uh, be a uh, challenge for many other governments to try and manage. We've been rewarded with seven successive credit rating upgrades and British Columbia enjoys a AAA credit rating today. One of only three provinces up until recently, just two, it was Alberta and BC that had AAA. Saskatchewan has now joined the ranks of the AAA club because they've seen enormous growth in oil exports and, and potash prices have been phenomenal and we certainly welcome them and of course the federal government. But that is, uh, it's more than just a, you know, AAA, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means lower borrowing costs for British Columbian taxpayers, and that goes right to our bottom line. Those are extra dollars that we get to invest in services or paying down debt, and it's money that we otherwise would be spending on interest charges. And, and I'll tell you, it's a really important signal for the uh, international investment market, too, that British Columbia is one of the safe harbors that they could go to to make investments, not just in our bonds, though we certainly welcome that if that opportunity arises, but also investing in our economy and creating jobs and moving businesses here and moving families here and, and building our economy. And so when I was in Europe and I was talking about our AAA credit rating, I was talking about the fact that we've reduced corporate tax rates by 40%. Our, our general corporate tax rate is now 10%. Our small business tax rate at 2.5%. We've got the most competitive business tax rates in the G7 right here in British Columbia. Uh, that's a pretty positive story. When I talk about our personal income tax rates having reduced by almost 40%, uh, where British Columbia, even if you throw in all the taxes, because you'll hear people say, oh yeah, Falcon, but you may have low personal income taxes, but you're hitting us with hydro increases or ICBC increases or what have you and you know it's just one or the other and but the fact of the matter is if you roll all those in our overall tax burden in British Columbia is the second lowest in the country only Alberta edges us out because they got no sales tax at all they cut a lot of oil revenue so God bless them but they they don't have some of the challenges we face in terms of not having that oil supply but but I'll tell you that is a really impressive story when you're talking to people that are seeing nothing but crisis turmoil debt deficits and downgrades happening all around them now, British Columbia and Canada really stand out we've got a very sound banking system the soundest banking system in the world right here in Canada 
that is a great strength for us. Um, we've got a federal government that's got a very low debt to GDP, 35%. Uh, British Columbia is, by the way, uh, British Columbia is at about uh, 18%. So we rank very well uh, compared to what, for example, they're seeing in Europe. Italy is about 100%, to give you an idea of debt to GDP ratios. France is at 81%, the UK about 73%. We all hear about Greece. Greece is, <laughs> it's like over the scale, but it's 166. They've got huge, huge challenges. Uh, the United States, 73%. And then, of course, Canada, 35, and British Columbia at 18. I'll tell you, that is something we ought to celebrate, and we will. Now, having said that, we want to make sure that, uh, that we, we continue to maintain that. That fiscal discipline is very, very important for the investment community and for markets, and I can tell you we're going to make sure that we retain that as a government. Now, um, the other thing you need to know that I think really came home to me is there's a lot of scared, nervous money in the world right now, and it's not sure where to go, and it's looking for safe harbors, safe harbors to where they can invest those dollars and know that they've got political stability, they've got economic stability, and they can earn a return in a, in a growing economy. And that is the great opportunity for British Columbia. And we're already seeing some of that. Uh, you know, Alcan's announcement of $3.3 billion investment to, uh, in the Kitimat aluminum smelter modernization is huge. I mean, what a signal that sends, over $3 billion in the northwest of this province. That, that is just enormously positive. The um, Western coal expansion, the $230 million investment, another um, positive thing to triple the production of metallurgical coal to 10 million tons annually, or Canada, even locally in Richmond, the Canada Sunrise Development Corporation's uh, almost $1 billion quintet project uh, development is huge. Those are the kind of investments that we can, we can look forward to. But we want to make sure that the markets around the world understand what the opportunity is. So for example, when I was in Zurich and I, I met with the uh, chairman and the senior executive team at Credit Suisse, one of the investments that you'll know about that they are subsequently, um, you'll see being made here in British Columbia is over $200 million. They purchased the old Vancouver Stock Exchange building. They're doing a complete reno and building a tower above it, adding more office space in, in a marketplace in Vancouver that needs it. But that's an over $200 million investment. But here's the thing, they're looking for more. And they see British Columbia as a growth opportunity. And the more we get our message out, the more we're going to see investments like that coming into British Columbia. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that uh, we'll continue to do, of course, is make sure that there's a strong uh, appetite for our BC bonds, uh, both domestically and internationally. We're very opportunistic. We go to where we think we can get the best value uh, for British Columbians, for taxpayers. Uh, but I'll tell you, when we did um, uh, recently, uh, earlier this year, uh, late last year, a US dollar denominated global bond issue, um, the interest, it was snapped up immediately. Like, you talk about a hunger for what is seen to be good value. Uh, British Columbia, two and a quarter billion dollars of bonds that were snapped up, uh, as I say, almost immediately. But what is also interesting for you to know, and the value of having a government that is fiscally disciplined, we're able to borrow 30 basis points cheaper than Ontario, for example. And that 30 basis points, right, there's 100 basis points, I know Percentile, I, I know the business community knows all this, but the, that 30 basis points means millions of dollars in savings for taxpayers in British Columbia. And so that's the virtuous cycle that you get into uh, when you maintain that kind of fiscal dis discipline. So we uh, and I and our government intend to make sure we continue that. We're going to balance our budget in 1314. Uh, we're going to make sure that we continue to have very tough control over expenditures. And we're going to make sure that any demands on government whether they are demands to spend more here, there, or everywhere, has to be done in the context of that kind of a fiscal framework. So as I've said publicly to the public sector unions, uh, when they come and say, you know, government, we all want big spending increases, my message has been very clear. There is no new money for giving raises to the public sector. What we have said is we will be creative and we will work cooperatively to see if we can find ways through what we call gain sharing to find savings within the fiscal envelope uh, by working with the unions to find productivity improvements or other savings that we can monetize and create uh, modest wage increases for them, we will do so. But don't expect that there's going to be new additional money being put in for wage increases. And I'll tell you why. Because you know what? At the end of the day, let's demystify government a bit. Government is no different than your family. We're not going to go and borrow money to pay for wage increases today 
and give the bill to our kids tomorrow. That is not responsible in a family and it's certainly not responsible in government. So that's the context at which we will be meeting some of the challenges that uh, we no doubt are going to face as we go forward. I also want to uh, just say for a minute that uh, as I think about uh, our budget and I think about the position we're in, you know, we are, as I mentioned, in a very, very strong position. Very low taxes, very competitive. Uh, we've got, as I say, very low debt, an opportunity to leverage that. We're going to be making sure that we look at the opportunities internationally of making investors aware of the BC and Canada story. And I always add Canada because I think there's a, a collective benefit there uh, to ensure that investors know about the opportunities here. We're going to be aggressive about that. We're also going to make sure that we look at everything we do in government. We're reviewing many of the crowns right now, making sure that they do everything they can to keep their costs down and ensure that they're doing everything they can to uh, demonstrate that kind of fiscal discipline that we're, uh, we're doing in government. We're going to look at uh, um, assets on our books that aren't generating the kind of revenues that could be generated. We want to make sure that we look at everything that we have in government and ensure that we're generating economic activity, that we haven't got assets sitting in our books that are costing us or not doing anything when they could be generating uh, revenues and opportunities for government. Those are all, uh, I think, important in the environment that we're in. And every year, the other thing uh, that we need to think about is, you know, every year we have a select standing committee of the legislature on finance, goes out, consults with British Columbians, and gives a report back to uh, myself as the Minister of Finance uh, on what they've heard in terms of government. I want to expand that public engagement. I do want to make sure the public understands what trade-offs are involved in balancing a budget. Um, I actually think it's important that the more we can demystify budget making, the better the public can understand what the choices are and what the trade-offs are. And it's one of the reasons why today I'm going to be announcing an online budget simulator. It's called the My BC Budget and it's a way for us to easily engage all of you and all of the public on understanding what it's going to take to balance a budget in British Columbia. And it is uh, available, we've even got some iPads here, if any of you want to try it afterwards, you can sort of go on there and, and play around with it. And I can tell you, I think it's a really good way to get the public understanding what's involved. You know, how does a Minister of Finance balance a budget? What, what can you do? You can increase taxes, you can cut spending, but all of those are trade-offs. And, you know, uh, there are those that are out there saying, you know, the answer is spend more, spend more, and tax more, and tax more. The, the problem is that you've got to think about the international context. Um, I can tell you investors aren't real excited about going into jurisdictions that have tax and spend policies. And I think the public instinctively get that, but they're going to really have to understand that. And I think the My BC Budget Simulator is really a great opportunity uh, for British Columbians to get online and, and have a look and, uh, again, try and demystify the budget process. The, thank you. The, the other thing is part of the BC Jobs Agenda that uh, that we promised to do was to appoint a panel of business experts to look at the business tax structure in British Columbia and make some recommendations to government. And this was really driven by my belief that uh, particularly in the wake of the, uh, the outcome on the HST and the fact that the HST went down and obviously going back to a PST we know is going to have some economic drag uh, on the economy. So it's probably a really good time to independently look at the business taxation in the province of British Columbia in all the rebates and all the programs that we have in government and really take a hard look at it and see how it stock stacks up against other jurisdictions around the world. Now we know we're extremely competitive on our tax rates, but what is it that we might do to even, you know, pole vault further than we are now to attract investment and to make British Columbia a place that people really want to go to, you know, raise a family, start a business, make investments. And so um, I'm really pleased to be able to announce today that we are going to be moving forward uh, with the appointment uh, of that independent panel. Uh, their report is going to be due at the end of August. I, it was Initially I was thinking about having it done before budget, but clearly it's, it's a big enough task that you're not going to credibly be able to take a look at all of the issues involved uh, in that kind of a time frame. So I want to make sure they take the proper time to look at this. It will be chaired uh, by Sarah Morgan Sylvester, uh, who is, uh, most of you will know, a highly respected leader, 
Chancellor of the University of British Columbia, a lot of experience uh, in the business uh, world in British Columbia in the financial services sector. Sarah was here earlier on. She had to leave to catch a flight to uh, Calgary, but I really want to thank her for serving. There's others that, that are going to be in the committee. And we're releasing that information today, but I'll very quickly say uh, Elio Luongo uh, from KPMG, Fiona McFarlane, uh, managing partner at Ernst & Young, uh, Laura Jones, senior VP uh, at uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Business, Lindsay Hall, a CFO at Gold Corp, Grace Wong, a former assistant dean with the Sauter School of Business, and Dale Wall, who's going to be an adjunct member uh, to deal with an issue around uh, business taxation at the municipal level. So all of them are going to form part of this committee. Many of them are here today. If they could stand up, the ones that are here, I'd like to recognize them and thank them for the work that they're going to be doing on all our behalf. Thank you. This will be the last time you receive applause, I can assure you. So. Thank you for that. So folks, let me uh, conclude by saying this. We are at a, a very exciting time, I really believe that, for British Columbia and for Canada. We have advantages that other jurisdictions would fall on their knees and pray for today. That, that they haven't even got the possibility to think of the opportunities that we've got in British Columbia, Canada. And our goal is to do something very un-Canadian like to actually go out into the marketplaces of the world, the people that are making investment decisions, and be very un-Canadian and say to them, you know what, if you want to invest, the best place to be is in British Columbia, Canada. We've got a great opportunity in this province. We've got lots of great things happening. The kind of capital investment we're making is the kind of capital investment that's going to grow and build our economy. It's in infrastructure. It's in post-secondary education. It's in our health sector. It's the kind of investment that builds a future and builds an economy, and that is our message that we're going to very aggressively take out into the world today. I want all of you to be ambassadors for that message. You need to be talking to all your business contacts, whether in the United States or across Canada or around the world, to make sure they understand the opportunities in British Columbia. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. And it's important because the world has really changed, it's really reconfigured. And one of the things that we try to do at HSBC is just give people sort of the big picture megatrend that's going on in the background because of course we turn on the, the TV and watch the news and we read the newspapers and we get caught up in the, the minutiae of the day. And so what I wanted to talk about today was actually opportunities uh, instead of just sort of the, the bad news that we're reading about all the time because I think there's great stories going on in the world. There's countries and, and billions of people who are actually living better and better and better every day. And while we, we in the U.S. are kind of licking our wounds and they're licking their wounds in Europe, actually around the world there are people who are living better lives than ever before. And we really are living in a golden era for homo sapiens. And our species really is doing relatively well. And believe it or not, there's ways to prosper. Uh, even here out in Vancouver, there's ways for us to electronically invest in countries all around the world. And that's what I want to talk about today. About opportunities in what we call a realigning multi-speed world. And it's really interesting because if you think about it, emerging markets are going to be growing much, much faster than what we're going to experience in the US, Europe, or even Canada. Probably 6% last year, and we'll probably be pretty close to that this year. 
And the interesting thing behind it is that you've got positive demographics. Emerging markets are relatively young countries. They've got populations much younger than what we have um, in advanced countries. And these uh, um, young populations